Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives and Member of Parliament for Tunapuna, Mr. Esmond Ford, Member of Parliament for St. Augustine, Ms. Khadija Amin, Member of Parliament for Karani East, Dr. Richard Sichuran. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I have the esteemed pleasure of welcoming you to the first edition of Meet the Members of Parliament, a call to action embracing change and enhancing business. With boundaries extending from Mount Lambert Circular Road to Golden Grove Road, Aruka, and the Northern Range to Guayama River, the Greater Tunapuna Chamber has been looking out for businesses since its formation in 1991. Membership consists predominantly of micro, small, and medium retail and wholesale enterprises. However, it is open to any individual, firm, association, or corporation engaged in business or professional or profession in Trinidad and Tobago. Our mission has been to influence policies within the greater Tunapuna business community and to establish the region as a business center of commercial success and high industry standards through the development of economic and social policies. This evening, we have three members of parliament from within our boundaries to speak with us, the business community, about the plans for their respective areas. Regretfully, the Minister of Public Utilities and members of, Member of Parliament for Lupino Borne West, the Honorable Mr. Marvin Gonzalez, is unable to attend this evening's meeting due to circumstances beyond his control. We hope having the Members of Parliament in this forum would shed light on various opportunities which businesses would be able to capitalize on. It is no secret the business community needs assistance especially as COVID-19 continues to wage war locally, regionally, and internationally, and lockdowns have become the weapon of choice as it pertains to containing the virus. We look forward to hearing their contributions as we continue to navigate this pandemic and seek to plan towards a brighter future. I now have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this evening. A seasoned broadcaster and media professional, Jessie May Venture has roughly 30 years media experience. At present, she hosts the Morning Brew Morning Show on CNC3 television. She is part of the news team at Guardian Media Limited, working as an editor on the online platforms for the Guardian newspaper and CNC3 television. Apart from the media, Jessie May also has worked with various government ministries and agencies and the United Nations in the corporate communications field. Jessie May. Thank you, Madam Chair. Melissa Sandhouse, President of the Greater Tunapuna Chamber of Industry and Commerce. The Honorable Khadija Amin, Member of Parliament for St. Augustine. The Honorable Ed Ed Esmond Ford, Member of Parliament for Tunapuna. Dr. The Honorable Rashad Sitaran, Member of Parliament for Karimi East. The Board of Directors of the Greater Tunapuna Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Members of the Greater Tunapuna Chamber of Industry and Commerce. All distinguished participants in today's virtual forum, members of the media, good evening, everyone. My task today is simple. I will be introducing each of the uh, presenters, uh, the feature speakers this evening, who will be sharing their visions for the sustainable economic development of their respective constituencies. Each speaker then will make their presentation for 10 minutes, after which we will open up the floor for questions for 15 minutes before moving on to the next speaker. Many of you will have sent in questions when you registered for this evening's uh, forum. And uh, we thank you for sending those questions in advance. Because great minds think alike, what we've attempted to do is group together according to similar themes, uh, the questions that you would have submitted in advance to ensure that we get as extensive coverage of the issues you want addressed as possible. But rest assured, the Secretariat and I will do our utmost to ensure that our presenters uh, respond to your questions today. 
So now that we've got the housekeeping out of the way, it's my privilege to begin our working session by introducing our first presenter. In August 2020, Khadija Amin was elected the Member of Parliament for St. Augustine. And prior to becoming an MP, Ms. Amin served as an opposition senator during the 11th Republican Parliament. She chose the path of working for her country through local government, having previously served as the chairman of the Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation. And she has served the greater Tunapuna area for many years faithfully and well. Without further ado, the member of parliament for St. Augustine, the Honorable Khadija Amin. Are you hearing me now? Yes, Madam MP, you, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I want to begin by thanking the Chamber for having this session. Um, I want to acknowledge the presence of members of Parliament of both sides of the House, as well as uh, other persons who are joining us. Um, I believe in collaboration and I served as a councillor at Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation from 2003. I became chairman in 2010. So I had the opportunity to participate in strategic planning at the regional as well as the national level as a councillor and also as chairman. It's now sitting as one of the M nine MPs whose borders fall within that Tunapuna region and who are influenced by the Tunapuna Chamber's activity. I really take a pleasure in participating, not only in this session, but certainly in the in going forward, um, the strategic planning that will take our region and the region that falls under the purview of the chamber forward. Um, as a member of parliament for St. Augustine, one of the flagship institutions of St. Augustine is the University of the West Indies. I also previously sat on a committee called the St. Augustine Education City Committee. And that was a committee of the Ministry of Tertiary Education that incorporated um, members of parliament, the chamber, the regional corporation. But the goal was to create a university city um, where the concentration of education institutions, um, including the, the, uni the U University of the West Indies, but also other tertiary education institutions, public and private, um, secondary schools, there are over 70 secondary schools and several primary schools. Um, and of course, dealing with the issues of traffic, the issues of supporting micro entrepreneurs, as well as commercial activities, the issue of um, upgrading infrastructure, um, particularly when it comes to connectivity, connectivity for the purpose of communicating, for sharing technology, and for security purposes, because the business development comes along with, um, with safety and security. As, and, and many of these objectives were built on environmentally friendly technology. So having increasing street lighting meant increasing solar lighting. And uh, managing traffic also meant park and ride, bike lanes, and so on. And this is something that I think that um, all of us could embrace different aspects of. And even now with the COVID pandemic, there are many aspects that require infrastructural work that we know may not begin with the um, less access to funding, but certainly planning aspect can continue and the vision can be kept alive. The St. Augustine constituency is also home of a lot of agricultural activity and quite a lot of farmers, particularly south of the Churchill Roosevelt Highway. The constituency's southern boundary is the Caroni River. The Caroni River Basin produces, I mean, there's a lot of um, rich agricultural land and a lot of active farmers from 
Maloney, uh, um, south of the highway, all that is in the Augustan constituency from where Mausica Road is, um, the, where Arawak is, that area south of the highway up to Bamboo by Grand Bazaar. So we are talking about Maloney, Orange Grove, um, Page, Bamboo, Valsin, South. All these areas have active agriculture, a lot of farmers. Some of them have um, title to land, some of them don't, but many of them produce agriculture on a scale that allows them to sell in the wholesale market, as well as to provide supermarkets from um, the conglomerates such as Massey, as well as small um, mini-marts and other businesses within the, the, the community. So agriculture is, to me, should be one of the things that we consider as um, when we go forward. But of course, the Carony River Basin is also plagued by flooding. And the tributaries that take water from the north, the mountain range, um, in, in the Tunapuna constituency, for instance, where there is a lot of uh, housing, there's a lot of built up um, infrastructure, a lot of coverage and um, a lot of concrete. Um, the runoff affects the Eastern Main Road. It affects businesses there, but it also affects the um, agriculture south of the highway because that water makes its way down to the Caroni River and we have flooding every year as we know. So while as a member of parliament with the limited resources, I think collaboration is important. So, so thus far, we have been able to be work with the drainage division, for instance, to do some improvement work that could bring some relief during the rainy season. But certainly I think for the, um, the Tunapuna area where there's a lot of commercial activities being affected by flooding every year on the Eastern Main Road in particular, is something that we have to begin to look at, collect data with a view of doing infrastructural improvement when funding becomes available. But we can begin our collaboration now to minimize or totally cut out that, that problem that I think has, there is an economic impact because businesses that are affected every year lose. We don't calculate the losses by our businesses. We don't calculate the losses by residents or by farmers. Um, so these are some of the aspects that I would like to see incorporated as we go forward in terms of what we would like to see in our region. Um, and we, even though boundaries separate us because uh, we represent different constituencies, the truth is that what happens in one affects the other. And then going forward, it's important for us to collaborate. Um, and I, as a member of parliament and a representative, I do look forward to hearing from the other members of parliament, but also that we could reflect on existing strategic development plans that were done by professionals. Um, even before I became chairman of the Tunapuna Corporation, we had the regional development plans that were done um, uh, on when Mr. Patrick Manning was the prime minister when Kamala Prasad Bisesa became prime minister, those plans were adopted by the cabinet and the corporations continued to work with them. I do believe that they have been updated, but the, the data that was gathered is still relevant and the input from the MPs and councillors at that time uh, was very valuable. So there may be some groundwork in terms of data to begin work with, but certainly we could um, take it forward together. I was also asked um, what work I expect, sort of development work I expect to be done in St. Augustine constituency. Because I am not a part of the government, I, I don't think um, I am in a position to say what work I expect to be done. I could say what I hope for. <laughs> Um, but the truth is that I recognize that a lot of development, a lot of infrastructural work is really done by um, political decisions. The number of, I see roads being paved in constituencies and I am begging for roads to be paved. Um, and, and I do hope that by continuing to collaborate with the ministers and government, we'll get some more much needed infrastructural development in St. Augustine, some of our major roads have a lot of potholes and are being damaged. Um, cars and vehicles are being damaged 
um, Evan Street in Yui, um, in Oropoon, quite a few. Um, but I'll continue to advocate for those things to be done. But I think the flooding situation in St. Augustine is one that I hope could be resolved because that would provide relief not only to St. Augustine, but to, to Napuna constituency, for example, because to Napuna is just north of the main road and the runoff comes down to St. Augustine. Um, so I, I don't want to um, predict what work will be done. I just want to hope that it will not be done um, with any political bias and that the development of the region could go forward um, based on what is really required and we could prioritize based on need and not on politics. Madam MP, have you come to the end of your presentation? Is there any final point you'd want to add? Um, I, well, that is it for now. I, I, I think I, it was suggested mm -hmm. that we talk about um, about what we hope to see yes and what we um what we expect you know but what i hope to see is not in line with what i expect and as i say because i'm an opposition mp um i have just have to depend on the 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 collaboration and the goodwill and the charity of the government but um i must say though that um quite a number of businesses have been stepping up um uh, we have been meeting with people who own businesses in the constituency who are willing and who have started to purchase, for example, purchase material for construction works for um, small drainage projects for material to patch some major roads, contractors who have volunteered their equipment. And the Tunapuna Corporation has indicated that they have labor available. So through that collaboration with the corporation, the businesses, and um, contractors who may have equipment, we have been able to do some work, but I do recognize that this is only a drop in the barrel, but the business sector plays an important role uh, for a member of parliament who um, really has to depend on charity and goodwill from <laughs> others to assist areas and persons in need. Okay, um, Madam MP, thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, there were a couple of questions that uh, popped up during your presentation, uh, which you sort of answered, but just for the benefit of everyone, if you could just uh, respond to them once more in case that anyone would have missed what you said earlier. Uh, one, are there any upcoming projects that would be able to stimulate the local communities and generate gainful employment for small construction companies? Um, construction is a, a, a capital expenditure that um, I know there may be limitations on. At this time, I believe that the, uh, whether it is the government or the or local, central government or local government would want to focus on critical critical projects only, projects that could cause harm, endanger the public in some way, projects that would um, perhaps reduce flooding. Um, those are some of the things that I know would be easier um, to be accepted and approved in terms of priority. Um, one that is with regards to construction. One thing I must mention, um, I spoke up to yesterday at um, the UNC's virtual report meeting about uh, micro entrepreneurs and facilitating small and medium businesses. In this pandemic period, a lot of people's side hustle have become their main hustle. A lot of people who had a job and lost their job are now trying to sell food, sell vegetable produce, um, and, and even arts and craft and so on. Um, one good example is the use of Eddie Hart um, Savannah car park for, for vending, especially for food vendors. Unfortunately, though, vendors from other areas are being evicted. The crab vendors in near to the Caroni River, Fall in St. Augustine constituency, they have received notices to remove their shed. Um, this is, a, or even though vending, roadside vending is illegal, I think it's important for the authorities at this time to facilitate um, 
micro entrepreneurs. So identify spaces within the region and all of us as MPs and even the chamber can play a role in identifying those spaces and the police would play a role in keeping those spaces safe rather than um, attempting to, to remove the vendors completely, demolish their, their structures and seize their goods. So the markets, uh, a market, the, the established markets will should continue to operate. But we can also have weekend markets, um, farmers markets, and food courts set up in different areas. So I, I do hope that the regional corporation, the TTPS, and others would rethink their approach when it comes to vending. And the HDC also has a role because people who vend within HDC developments, that is also an offense. If you are selling hot dogs out of your, out of your apartment, that is not allowed according to the HDC. So that is another area where it, when, it, when it comes to the question of um, micro entrepreneurs that I hope that the MPs who are here would be able to support. Um. I want to go back to uh, the point that you made about the fact that in your constituency in particular, you have several flagship tertiary education institutions. Yes. And uh, the point that you made also about um, technology and the fact that, you know, already there is some infrastructure in your constituency to advance the knowledge-based industry, the knowledge-based industries. Um, what is your your overall vision as in how far do you think this can this can be taken and what are the opportunities you see for businesses in this regard given this uh foundation that's been laid with all the tertiary institutions in your constituency there are several models internationally that uh, trinidad and tobago can follow um for instance cambridge as a university tongue um, you have examples in Singapore and in other countries that we can take elements of and apply to Trinidad and Tobago and to St. Augustine as an education city. The University of the West Indies, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, um, and the other tertiary education institutions should be offering courses um, that are in line with the development goals of the country, the national development goals giving scholarships to encourage studies in these areas would boost our human resource so that you also have after graduating, after research is done, we have to encourage business incubation so that the research that the university students do, when you go to do your PhD, where does the information go? You leave the, the university with a title, with a PhD or a master's, but what happens to the valuable research that you would have done as a student? This could be put to work and incentives should be provided for research to be done in the areas that the government has designated as their development objectives. So that the business incubation should be around the university area as well, just in close proximity but it should also be connected um, because internet is no longer a, a luxury, it's a utility, just as electricity and water is now. Um, having the business incubation allow the, the chamber and established businesses to benefit, but it would also allow young entrepreneurs to, to, to take root. Blackberry was developed in this way out of research RIM, out of research in a university. And that turned into, I mean, Blackberry that went worldwide. Um, so I think we can do that. We also, I think, have to provide free zones within the Tunapuna and St. Augustine areas because we have so much business. We do have the industrial estate, the Trinity and McCoy industrial estates. Um, and I think that is something the business chamber could advocate and could have a better say in, in terms of what would, be, what would suit them. But I think tying in the research that comes out of the university, the, the young minds that, uh, that have so much information and knowledge that they could put forward, um, using the technology to keep us connected, 
but also the fact that we could connect even through our security cameras, um, the TTPS, the University of the West Indies and the businesses. If you combine their camera network, you, get, uh, you could get, probably get such a huge coverage. And this has to be also tied in with national security so that um, we could have a response for not only for when a crime is committed, but even for, um, for um, to prevent, of course, to prevent crime, but not only for criminal activities. Um, and those are some of the things that I think the business chamber could play a greater role in. Um, I also think that there is the daylight commerce and there's the nightlife. In Kirap, for example, and in Tunapuna, before the pandemic, you could go at any hour and get something to eat. That is an industry by itself, that nighttime informal um, um, commercial activity. And this is something we should support. Um, it is said that St. James is a city that never sleeps, but I don't think Kirap Junction ever sleeps. And these are things we have to encourage and nurture. So, um, to me, that all of that is part of what could become our university town in, um, in St. Augustine. Connectivity in terms of public transport. We are plagued with traffic problems. The highway, the Eastern Main Road, and the Priority Bus Route has a lot of traffic in Tunapuna. So providing parking facilities so that a person could park their vehicle and take public transport to move around the Tunapuna, St. Augustine area, that is something that we have to work on. We have limited space because so much, so many of our spaces have buildings. We have very few open lots. So we will have to, you will have to utilize spaces, for instance, over the highway and the Orange Grove Estate, where you have large parcels that could be developed for parking, but you must have reliable public transport that will take you around, like around the town bus that will take you to any part of Tunapuna or St. Augustine. And it has to be safe and it has to be reliable so that a person from any social standing in, in, in our society, any economic bracket will feel safe to park their vehicle and take a bus and go to any part of St. Augustine or Tunapuna and businesses will not be affected. They will get their customers and they will not be plagued by traffic and parking issues. There are many people who don't go to Tunapuna because of parking, because it's trouble to just to park your vehicle. Um, so those are things I think will make business um, better for customers as well as for the business owners. Um, we also have uh, another question. This is addressing um, the situation of the socially displaced. I believe, yes, uh, the socially displaced um, uh, in the Tunapuna area, uh, whether they are the what we would consider the traditional homeless, but also the more recently displaced. Do you have any prescriptions or any ideas as to how that particular issue could be handled um, within your constituency? What would you, what would you, if, if you, if you had the power, what would you do? Um, I must say, first of all, that this is not an area that I have really done a lot of social work in when it comes to homeless persons. Um, I do know that the Ministry of Social Development have had programs that have worked and not worked. We have Ozenville Park that is always well populated with, um, with homeless people. We do have a lot of charitable organizations and religious organizations that uh, provide meals. Um, but we have, I am not aware of any um, place that the government has established or the state has established to treat with the homeless in um, Tunapuna. I know even, I am a business owner as well. And I know that um, myself and my other um, business owners close to me on Eastern Main Road, um, we have our share of vagrants to put up with. So it is not something that I have um, ventured into as a representative or as a business owner in terms of how to treat with it. I do know that the mental health aspect of it is very, is very serious and very important. Um, many of those people who are on, on the streets have mental health issues. 
And we have to be able to treat with that um, in, in, in a healthy way um, as we go forward. But I do know too that um, we have issues with providing housing on the East-West Corridor, but that might be something separate from the homeless. So um, I would leave the, the treatment of the homeless to others, but I must say that it is something that I do recognize and um, I think we have the resources within the region to treat it because we do have a lot of churches and charities who are willing to contribute and who do so even now without a structure. Hi, Jesse, may you were muted. Yes, I believe that um, those are the main questions that would have come through for you. Um, Honorable MP, and uh, as such, we're going to bring your uh, segment of today's proceedings to a close and uh, move on to the next presenter. Uh, before we bring him on, however, we need to recognize and welcome Mr. Rival Chattagoon, the president of the Arima Business Association. So good evening to you, Mr. Chattagoon, and thanks for joining us this evening. We appreciate you being here. Um, Madam, Madam Moderator, Pinto, I, yes. Esmond Fordier, yes. um, I know you're now going to introduce me with regards to uh, my, my, my presentation, but yes. in terms of, of some of the um, information with regards to my colleague, Khadija Amin, you know, is it possible that some clarity, some, I could just shed some light on one or two little matters quickly? Is absolutely, absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, afternoon, Khadija. I mean, how are you? It's good afternoon, each and everyone. Good um, afternoon. Ford, good yes. 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 Um, well, I know we, we both came out of the local government network. We worked together. You were my chairman. At Tunapuna, at Tunapuna, 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 Tunapuna yes. Regional Corporation. And I, there I got my, my feet wet. Right? Just uh, as we know, we have a relationship. Right? With regards to quickly, with regards to flooding on the Eastern Main Road, that area between the Market and Ozenville Road, we did some infrastructure work where we built a drain on the railway road heading out from the Eastern Main Road to the Priority Bus route. right? We uh, have it going through some testing period now when the rainy season come to see if additional work would be need to be done on the Southern side of the Eastern Main Road, which as we know falls within St. Augustine, the Eastern Main Road being the boundary, right? We also have some infrastructure work to start soon in the Balthazar Street, McCoy Road area by course cut, not course cutter, that's Disco Mart. We also plan to do some work up at the St. Cecilia Road, Pentecostal Road area by OGS wholesalers, right? Again, we have some flooding issues there. It's just to ensure that we get the water quickly because as the rain finish, finishes, usually the water runs off within 10 to 15 minutes. Um, again, the collaboration, as you know, um, MP Amin, feel free to communicate with me so that we can go forward with regards to to anything. We did some work by UBSpec with regards to some drainage infrastructure by the drain that comes out on St. Augustine Circular Road. And you are correct. Businesses have been identified and contractors have been identified who are making contributions of materials in order for work to be done by either the Unemployment Relief Program workers or by the Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation. I agree with you with regards to the micro entrepreneurs where we can identify spaces. Yes, we know vending is, Ill is, is illegal, but as you said, by the, by the Karini Bridge, those crab, since I know myself, I've been seeing those vendors there. So again, we can probably lobby the Tunapuna Piaku Regional Corporation to see how we can, can get you know, those young entrepreneurs, um, not legalized, but at least ensure that they can vend there without any major issue. With regards to the displaced persons in your society, again, St. Augustine and Tunapuna is one, as far as I see, is one town, because in growing up, over the main road by the market was, is Tunapuna, and still is Tunapuna. So with regard to the displaced persons society, one of the things I am communicating with uh, the Ministry of Social Development is in order to have some sort of facility similar, like what we have in Fort Spain at Besson Street, you know, the old car park which was converted, 
as we all know, um, there is no legislation in place to move those individuals out of the streets. Once you move them, the court will rule that you have to release them as the case may be. So what we are trying to do is to build some sort of facility so that they can come when the night come and move out during the day. Again, those things are in the pipeline, but again, based on the present scenario, we'll probably try to see how, how those things will work out. And again, you made some valid point with regards to the, the Cambridge University, right? I know about the Boston Triangle with regards to the university city. I've been pushing for the Ministry of Education to bring that committee back on stream so that again, St. Joseph, St. Augustine and Tunapuna can utilize the expertise within the area to ensure that we benefit tremendously. Yes, we have over 70 educational institutions between CREP and the Takarigua area, right? It's the most densely populated area with regards to educational, facility, educational institutions. And we need to ensure that we do something uh, with regards to the traffic and, and things like that. Um, also, last point, um, the National Special Economic Zone, it's a proposal that the Ministry of Trade and Industry is coming up with. And again, the, the Chamber will be made aware of those things in order to ensure that the Macquarie and Twin City Industrial Estate benefit from it. But other than that, um, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with some of your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vento. Thank you very much, Mr. Ford. Um, well, as he indicated, uh, he is the member of Fortuna Puna. Um, he's also a current deputy speaker of the House of Representatives. And yes, he has served in local government as a councillor, as well as vice chairman of the Tunapuna Piapo Regional Corporation. And he's also a man full of ideas and definitely solution oriented. So we are looking forward to hearing more of the solutions that he intends to present to us uh, today. Uh, let us welcome the member for, of Parliament for Tunapuna, the Honorable Esmond Ford, to take the floor once more. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Again, good evening again to all. And um, it's a privilege to be invited by the Greater Tunapuna Chamber of Industry and Commerce to Ms. Senhaus and her executive members for the invitation and for again for hosting this program. Usually I know it's 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 usually a, a physical meeting, but again, in these circumstances, we have to go virtual. Uh, I would just like to take uh, two minutes, just one, one minute actually, just to extend condolences to the family of, of uh, Honorable Former Minister Senator Franklin Khan on his passing, and also to Mr. Singh, who I don't know, a 28-year-old gentleman who was shot yesterday at Rupnarine's gas station in Tunapuna. Right, uh, many of I showed the members present would know Mr. Rohan Rupnarine, who was a past, who is also a member of the chamber. I would just like to extend sincere condolences. And also for my MP colleague, I got my COVID vaccination on Saturday. I had a slight temperature on Sunday. And what he mentioned to me is that he got his vaccination yesterday. And you know, he has a slight temperature and is slightly under the weather with regard to that COVID vaccine. All right, Esmond Ford, as you all said, uh, former councillor, former Tunapuna Piaku Regional Corporation Vice Chairman and elevated to Member of Parliament status in 2015 and elevated again for a second time in 2020. So I'm now serving my second year too. Um, I'm married, two children, and um, my whole principle is about serving, ensuring that the Tunapuna community that developed me, that I can now give back to the particular community. My vision for Tunapuna is simple, right? Uh, to ensure that we can reach borough status and then eventually probably outside of my tenure, uh, city status, right? Because we have all the amenities in order to go to a borough status, right? But again, within the local government system, there are guidelines of how you can attain borough status. And you know, it's, hard to it's hard to understand that the reason why Tunapuna Piaco cannot go to borough status just yet is because of the size of the borough, being one of the largest in terms of physical size and also in terms of population, right? That's one of the reasons that they are saying that we cannot go to the borough seat as just said, but that will be work in progress as we go along. Again, Tunapuna, again, is bounded by the Northern Range. And as my colleague, Senator um, MP Amin mentioned, again, it's basically a flood prone area, especially on the Eastern Main Road, right? We have to dredge our 
three, river, three main river courses every year to ensure that again, the water runs out quickly. And then once it reaches the Eastern main road, again, because of the need for improved drainage in, in infrastructure south of the Eastern main road, which really falls within the St. Augustine area, you know, we need to ensure that that water runs out quickly. So I'll have to work close with, with my MP colleague for St. Augustine to ensure that at least we get the great drainage running at least straight out over the Churchill Roosevelt Highway, as the case may be. Right, so again, the goal for Tunapuna is to ensure that again, traffic, which is one of the main bugbearers within the Tunapuna area. Um, again, that's the reality. Two major projects are in the system to, to take place within Tunapuna within now and 2025. One, which is the continuation of the Churchill Roosevelt overpass from Kurep Junction, from Kurep by Kedona, as we would know, straight up to Piako Junction, right? Drawings are already in place, all right? Uh, again, but based on the economy, the present state of the economy, and with regards to COVID-19, again, just two weeks ago, we had some updates whereby the possibility of some of those major projects may have to be deferred, not necessarily terminated, but deferred in terms of getting the financial allocation, right? Which as you know, we are trying to ensure that we go straight up to Sandy Grandi with regards to ensuring that no traffic lights would exist along the Churchill Roosevelt Highway as we go along. A second major project, and again, um, my colleague Amin uh, alluded to it, which is with regards to the traffic and the density population of schools and educational institutions where we have traffic day in, day out. Right, there's a proposal also with the ministry. Drawings have already been done. Uh, costing have also been put in place, which is for a Cora Takarigua Tunapuna bypass road, which will commence from St. Michael Road in Takarigua, running to the back of Paradise Gardens, straight down to the Cora River, and with a Bailey Bridge going across the Cora River to bring you out on Cora Road to ensure that again traffic is eased up because as those of you all who use the East-West Corridor by Eddie Hart, we know the bottleneck that we will have at Eddie Hart Junction and Orange Grove Road there with regards to getting into Tunapuna. So that's another project. It's a costly item. And again, that also may be on hold as we go into the near future, right? Those are two major plans that we are looking at. We also are looking at some other link roads with regards to um, ensuring that my area goes up to the Maracas area in Akono. We are looking at the Altitude Gardens where we need to put a bridge, a traffic bridge in order to take them into their homes. Right now they walk across uh, a makeshift bridge and then they also pass through people's property. We are also looking at the possibility of opening up the St. Michael village, Mount St. Benedict, looking at ecotourism, right? As we know, Mount St. Benedict could be turned into a major tourist attraction, right? The monastery that is up there. We are looking also at at including the Maracas Valley and also the Cora Valley with regards to some ecotourism development where we are going to transform the Cora Valley poolside one, poolside two, the building that is there, transform it into an activity center where on weekends it can be used for market vendors. Again, it can be utilized for functions for individuals within the area. And again, ensuring that the various religious organizations, the Hindus, the Muslims, the, the, the full gospel, the Anglicans, the Catholics would have their various locations along the river to continue to perform their rights. Again, that is also a project that may be on hold, again, due to the costing. And probably, you know, I can have discussions with the, the Greater Tunapuna Chamber Executive to see how we can enter some public private partnership for the community in order to work that forward. Uh, another um, project into, the, into 2025 is rebuilding of the Girl Guides Hut. Again, actually it, it has already started. It's about 90% complete where we have a Girl Guides Hut, which was property that was leased to the Girl Guides. And we are now building that on two sale lane in Tunapuna, which is almost 90%, 90% finished. We are looking at establishing, uh, establishing a Tunapuna International Sports Program. We know that throughout the years, a lot of individuals would have passed through Tunapuna some good sporting athletes, and we are looking at reviving a sort of a sort of Burnley Sports Club. You know, we we, we can talk about uh, Mr. Clark. We can talk about former footballer Eddie Hart, former footballer um, 
um, Ken Hodge, we can talk about cricketer, um, and Ilraj and those guys who just in the St. Augustine area, Prakash Mosai and those guys. So we're looking at having an international sports in order to cater for the young ones within the, within the community. Uh, also, we are, it has already started at Tunapuna Udes. Again, from being a member of parliament for the last five years, the amount of youth that come to the office and some of them don't know about, about for doing a resume, how to go through an, an interview, how to do a job application, how to, how to, you know, um, how to get a job, right? So we have set up this Tunapuna Youth Desk, which is headed by a young man named Mr. Campbell within the community. He has an executive team and we are doing, they will be seeing everything with regards to youth within the community to ensure that we minimize the amount of youth that will be on the streets within uh, the Tunapuna community. Um, as we know, infrastructure, again, yes, I'm the MP for the area, but again, infrastructure falls within the various ministries, the local government, uh, the Ministry of Works and Transport, the Tunapuna Piak Regional Corporation, the URP program. Again, I will just facilitate by providing some of the roads that I think as a layman that would need to be done, right? In order to think we have done numerous amount of paving within the Tunapuna constituency. What we try to do is to pave and ensure that the main access roads from Kureb Junction coming into Tunapuna straight up to, up to Cora are paved to ensure and to minimize that whole mindset of you know, not being comfortable when you're driving on the road. Because that's the concept that I have as the MP in that once my traveling public can be comfortable so like, for instance, Syndrome Road was paved, Orzonville, not Orzonville Road, Cornell Street was paved. Certain areas of the Eastern Main Road, which were the worst ones, have since been paved, drainage infrastructure, and we can go on and on and on with regards to some of those achievements. Um, well, again, as my Senate MP colleague mentioned, we have roughly about four AGC housing development, um, development compounds within our area. Again, as the MP, I'm working along close with them to ensure that, again, those that need painting, right now I'm dealing with Peace Tree, where they have some manual covers and, and some repairs that need to be done within the compound. So we are working on those things. Um, the social aspect is very important. Again, one of the projects that I'm discussing also is again to have this facility whereby, because remember the St. Mary's Children's Home fall within my constituency. And as, let's be real, not all of them, when they reach and attain age 18, are facilitated, whether employment, whether going into the police service, the fire service, the Coast Guard, or finding some sort of employment. Some of them are displaced and they end up in the Eddie Hart Savannah. Then they graduate to Constantine Park. Then they graduate to Orzenville Park, as said by my colleague. So what we're trying to do is to minimize. So if we can have this facility, right, where we can be supplied with a piece of land in order to ensure that we could put that in place, that will be a great asset for Tunapuna. One of the things that we were contemplating is relocating the Tunapuna fire station. Because at times, in peak period again, it's difficult for the fire ambulances and the fire brigades in order to leave their compound. So we were trying to identify uh, a location in the St. Augustine constituency over the Church of Roosevelt Highway by the McCoy area there in order to create some sort of see if it would be an easier access in order, but again, those are things that are in the system. Whether it will happen between now and 2025, it's difficult to say because again, the minister, the Ministry of Finance will have to determine the viability of those, of those projects and in terms of going forward with regards to that. Traffic again, continue to be, as we said, the main bug bearer. So again, we need to identify some spots, um, whether it's the park and ride somewhere on the highway and you're coming to Tunapuna, because again, a lot of businesses are mushrooming. You know, Tunapuna is not this normal small store again, right? The four major banks are situated in Tunapuna now. We have major businesses, the Sharon's bookstores, we have Mohammed bookstores, we have Pennywise now open a, 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 a massive mall in Tunapuna. Right next door, the Old Republic Bank building is now being renovated. I have not been able to ascertain what is going there just yet. You know, we have the Tunapuna administrative complex. And even though during COVID, and we know it's tight, but a lot of business have mushroomed within the Tunapuna area. And again, you know, as we go forward, we need to ensure that, you know, that things are taken care of as we go forward. 
I would just like to end um, with regards to mentioning where does the greater Tuna Tuna Chamber Industry and Commerce comes in. Again, the government have been speaking about public-private partnership within our communities, right? Uh, MP Amin mentioned about the Eddie Hard Grounds, car park, and the food facility, right? Some adjustments have uh, in the pipeline to take place there, right, as we go forward. But like, for instance, Eddie Hard is one of the most utilized facility within the East-West corridor, and I probably might be Trinidad and Tobago, right? Because we did a survey, and over 4,000 individuals use Eddie Hart on a daily basis from as early as 4 to 10 in the morning. And it could go as late as 11 to 12 o'clock at night, right? So we have a food court, we have a car park, we have the Belgrose Crematorium right next door. Thousands of people exercise there daily. So again, things like bathroom facilities, I know the corporation is trying their best in order to come up with a budget to do it. So again, if the Greater Tunapuna Chamber could come on board in order to provide the materials, whether you all have representatives who own hardwares, um, different things like that, have additional stores where we can utilize, you know, the materials from those from those industries and we can have the Tuna Puna Piak Regional Corporation provide the labor, right? We can look at trails development, the Cora Valley, Christine, the Maracas Valley, St. John, individuals go up there exercising daily utilizing those areas. Trails can be developed. They were there, but again, with, with the advent of crime and so on, the trails between Tuna Puna into Lopino, those trails were abandoned. The trails between Cora Valley into Maracas, those trails were abandoned, but they are still there and we can develop, develop them with regards to ecotourism as we go forward. We can also look at the possibility of the skill set that comes from within the, your chamber right, the individuals who are in the IT, marketing, business acumen. A lot of you all would have small businesses, the expertise. We can meet and link to see how best we can assist, not the MP for Tuna Puna, but the community of the greater Tuna Puna, which as you say, run from, from Mount Lambert, straight up to Old and Grove Road, incorporating Karini, and also the Northern Range, right? As, as, as um, MP Amin mentioned, nine constituents, constituents falls within that boundary. So we can try our best to see what we can do. Again, we talk about the ecotourism for poolside one, poolside two. We can look and see how best, because all those plans are already in train, but the funding is where we need in order to ensure. And if we wanna, if I wanna end now by saying, the present need, again, our colleagues, our brothers, our families in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, right, this last Sufre volcano, right? contributions. I know that the Ministry of Trade and Industry would have contacted some of you all so that some of you all may be dealing directly with the, the, the ministry. But again, through the MP office, right, through the MP office, I have a facility where I'm collecting stuff. I probably have about just about 300,000 worth of goods at my um, MP office there now in order to go out this week. And what we try to do is to deal with specific, sometimes the, the, the big picture we may be looking at, but again, some individuals may not be may not be touched. So what we try to do is to work around with the with the like for instance the University of Southern Caribbean, where the president there is of Vincentian, and I'm liaising with him directly in order that we are given actually names, NGOs, groups in order to deal with. So again, you all may be doing it on a holistic scale, but we can also break it down to do it. Then. As the MP for Tuna Puna, I try my best to utilize the businesses within the, within the Tuna Puna area, right? The jersey that you, the, the logo that you're seeing here, again, it would have been done by through one of your members, right? The, the badge that I'm wearing here, I got my COVID vaccine again, one of your members, uh, individuals, Pennywise, the Blue Waters, all the uh, Mohammed Bookstore, Sharon, those individuals, some of the hardwares, right? We do business with them in order to ensure that we provide and we give back within the community. So again, thank you and appreciate being here. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Ford. Uh, we do have a couple, um, not questions per se, but um, certainly responses uh, to your presentation that you would that you just shared with us. Uh, I want to tackle the second one first which is coming from uh, Alison Skinner-Walker. 
and she's looking at the issue of Eddie Hart Grounds, which you did address in your presentation, and particularly the issue of vending. She says there is very little parking now for patrons who wish to use the facility. She also wants to know um, what exactly is the criteria for vending. Clearly, it needs to be managed because the vendors appear to be encroaching on the green spaces. And uh, she also is expressing concern about the sanitization of those grounds as well, which is a critical issue given the current COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Kina Walker. Again, as mentioned by, by both individuals, physically, the Eddie Hard grounds falls within the St. Augustine constituency. But again, it's a very influential ground with regards to the individuals of Tunapuna, because a lot of individuals utilize the ground. The Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation is the one responsible for all open spaces, recreation facilities uh, throughout Trinidad and Tobago. So they are the ones responsible for Eddie Hart. With regards to the, the ground itself, yes, there's a car park. Yes, there's also a food court. There is plans in order to move the food court north of the present car park. Again, all those things were supposed to start to commence end of 2019 into 2020. And again, all those things are on hold at present with regards to Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation. So what happens presently is that the food court operate on the car park where individuals park, as well as those who vend, right? Again, there's a custodian there and they try to manage it, but not all times it is able to be managed properly so sometimes individuals park between the vendors as we go along into the evening, into the night, as the case may be. That's one. Sanitization. As far as I'm aware, they had they set up four different points of where they have water, running water, right? Where they have running water in terms of the actual sanitization, where I know the last time one was done uh, was probably early in the year, in January, where they shut it down for two days in order to spray and to sanitize. I'll have to communicate with the chairman, Alderman Tracy Robinson, in order to ascertain when a next sanitization is um, planned. And you're correct with regards to COVID, it's important to ensure that proper sanitization takes place. And then as we well, I mentioned about the encroaching, and it's just a heavily utilized um, um, business venture colleagues. People come from all Dago Martin in the West, Shogonas, to come up to the area facility to utilize it. So again, um, MP, I mean, what we can do, we can probably have a discussion with, with the Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation in order to ensure that they come up to scratch and standard is maintained at the area facility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. MP. Uh, another um, comment here. This concerns the, the displaced persons in Tunapuna. Um, and the comment is coming from uh, Barbara John. I would like to recommend partnering with the St. Vincent de Paul night shelter located at the back of the Cyril Ross nursery uh, to deal with this particular issue. Your response, Mr. MP. Um, Ms. John, um, I'll need to verify if that St. Vincent de Paul facility is still operational on Basilon Street at the back of the Cyril Ross Nursery. Uh, is Ms. John online? Can she verify that if it's presently operational? Because the last time I inquired, I was told that it is not operational. But again, very good idea. We can try to incorporate it because it's a facility that has, that has been there or is there for a number of years where individuals used to come there in order to think, but I'll follow up on it and I, I can communicate with Ms. Barbara John and also with regards to the St. Vincent de Paul and the matter. I, I'm not hearing you, um, Madam Moderator. I'm not hearing you. My apologies, I forgot okay. to unmute okay. my mic. Yes, I'm seeing someone here commenting with regard to illegal um, vending being illegal without a license and perhaps reminding us all, and you and your MP colleague, that um, 
perhaps something needs to be put in place to have vendors that are using these facilities properly registered to bring some sort of control to what's taking place? Um, again, colleagues, um, okay, vending is illegal. That's, that's, that's a norm. But what we are saying, the regional corporation, like what it did at Tunapuna, at, at, at the Ediat facility, right? What, like, what they have done in Penal, by the Penal doubles vendors and so on, which is a popular place, right? What they have done around the screen, Spark Savannah, the co particular municipality or corporation can put things in place where they invite individuals to come to this location. You, get, you are assigned a spot. You have to pay a monthly subscription to utilize the facility. It must be kept in a certain sanitized, clean condition where you can vend. Yes, vending is still illegal, but each municipality within their environment, they put aside which part they organize them, right? So again, vending is illegal, but what they try to do is they incorporate in order to ensure that young entrepreneurs and as, as MP, I mean, it's correct. During this COVID pandemic period, individuals who have been displaced at their jobs, who have not gone back out to work, they can now utilize if they could make kuma, if they could make tolo, if they could make sugar cake, and they could now go to a location where they can sell these commodities. Thank you. We do have a, a question here with regard to digitizing businesses, for example, data collection, marketing, sales, payment systems, transport, distribution, and education. Uh, that is coming from Hezekiah KB. Okay. Um, again, uh, Mr. Hezekiah, again, digitizing, right, as you all would realize by now within the last budget presentation, 2020-2021, uh, the Minister of Finance and our Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Rowley, has instituted a ministry with regards to digitizing uh, the, the digitizing in Trinidad and Tobago. So it's a ministry that is headed by Minister Senator Bacchus, and they are working along with the public administration a ministry in order to bring this whole digitization, futuristic development on stream as we go forward. Yes, COVID may have brought it on, but again, it's to ensure that as we go forward, we ensure that we keep abreast. That, that we keep abreast. I like the whole presentation, everything very nice. There's something I'm going to I'm sure if it's right. Uh, Ms. John, you need to mute your mic, please. Yeah. Thank you. Right, so again, um, I would not be able to give any major details, but it's something that will be within the future. And again, the Greater Tunapuna Chamber will be brought, brought abreast with regards to the updates, with regards to the digitization in Trinidad and Tobago. But excellent question, and it's the way forward for the future. Um, I believe this is going to be it for you, Mr. Ford. Um, and thank you so much for your presentation this evening as well as being so open uh, with your responses and also sharing your vision. Now Thank you very much, I do appreciate it. Now we come to our third presenter for this evening. Uh, Dr. The Honorable Rishad Sicharan is the member of parliament for Karani East and he was first elected to the House of Representatives in August, 2020. He now sits as part of the 12th Republican parliament he also functions as the Shadow Minister of Health on the opposition benches. Let us warmly welcome to make his presentation, Dr. The Honorable Rishad Sicharan, Member of Parliament for Karani East. You have the floor, Dr. Sicharan. Hi. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Hello. Um, so thank you for having me here at the Greater Tunapuna Chamber of Industry and Commerce. I'd like to thank the president for inviting me. I'll also like to thank my fellow contributors, um, MP Esmond Ford, as well as my colleague, MP Khadija Amin. Very, very good contributions. And um, I'd like to thank you all for, for viewing this, um, this activity that we are doing here today. I, I will speak today um, generally um, on national 
issues and, and then we could focus it onto Karani East. So I did a little bit of research and I, I came up with six topics um, with regards to embracing change and enhancing business. The first one is we need to institute measures to promote productivity and growth. So the economist Paul Kirkman said, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. So one of the essential features of the strong and deep economic performance that we will need to see happening post pandemic is strong productivity growth. And we must take effective actions that would, that would boost this productivity. So while the private sector has deployed technology to boost commercial ventures, the government must also expand human capital and infrastructure. And this would include a number of things, including widening educational opportunity, low business and housing loans, as well as improved infrastructure. And it's only through higher productivity can wages and living standards improve. But another part that can be attributed to digital acceleration, which COVID-19 boosted, was the transition to remote working. So that is something that I hope that we look to in the future, similarly to like what we're doing here today, where we didn't have to go all go to a hall and rent a hall and, and have this, um, this forum where we, we are doing it remotely. So the hope is that the need to react to the COVID-19 pandemic might accelerate the process of remote working and setting up a productivity surge. So that was my first point. My second point is we need to enable businesses to boost technology adoption and innovation. So there are proven catch-up approaches that help to, to boost productivity. And these would include removing barriers to competition and services, cutting red tape that impedes business formation and dissolution, and allowing more effective reallocation of human and financial resources as new technologies emerge and productivity gains shift across industries. And that is something that we probably didn't do in the Point Lisa estate, as we are seeing a lot of our businesses there are being closed. Additionally, the productivity of the public sector and regulated sectors, such as healthcare, have been notably slow to improve. And, and these would need to have to be addressed post pandemic. My third point, was that we need to build the necessary infrastructure and social capital. So productivity doesn't, productivity growth doesn't just happen. The conditions need to be right. And the focus should be on projects with the highest likelihood of significant economic returns and benefits to quality of life. And these projects should be completed as efficiently as possible. Every dollar that is overspent is one that cannot be applied to our social programs. And it's another dollar wasted. So our infrastructure spending has been declining over the years. Um, the usual suspects, as Ms. Amin had said, um, Member of Parliament Amin had said, roads, water, transport, power and bridges, you know, these all have to be addressed. So COVID-19 has accelerated the use of digital technologies in business, and, but the pandemic has also highlighted gaps in, in our digital provision. In terms of education, such deficits are likely to have damaging long-term effects, particularly those parents who were not able to afford devices. You know, we went through most of the school year and a, a lot of students did the entire syllabus on a phone, a small little screen, you know? So I'm very concerned for these students, you know, how they will perform in SCA, how they'll perform in CXC, you know, is a very, very concerned as well as we have to remember the students in standard one, two, three, or form one, two, three as well. So the pandemic has demonstrated there are also economic costs to systemic weaknesses. And, and these have to be addressed. Um, in addition, health, our health infrastructure is not only a cost, but it's an investment. And we saw that with the Cuba hospital, whereby many countries around the world, they, they had to scramble to build hospitals um, that, that, that would deal specifically with COVID-19 patients. 
And we here in Trinidad and Tobago, we were so lucky to have this state-of-the-art hospital that, that we just basically utilize for COVID-19 patients. And, and we are seeing the value of that right now. Imagine if we had to go to Port of Spain General Hospital or Mount Hope Hospital and, and COVID-19 patients were being rushed in through emergency the same time your dad had a heart attack and is right there as well. You know, so this is some things that we didn't have to go through. We were, we were able to utilize the Cova Hospital as well as the Cora Hospital for COVID-19 patients. And we were very, very fortunate in that respect. My fourth point was that we need to support individuals so that they can benefit from the coming economic transition. You know, we can't rely on energy forever. So the demand for technolo technological skills is accelerating and the supply is not keeping up. In today's fast and changing global economy, this means working with businesses, unions, and other entities that categorize their skills and their, their, how they serve the economy and identifying the best practices and effective programs in order to support them. The private sector is the engine that powers the creation of jobs and wealth, and without which the government can do very little. So social policy should be revised to better match today's economic realities, such as the rise of the part-time worker. Government policies related to work, unemployment, and income support have not changed much over the years, and, and we need to adapt. My fifth point is that we need to nurture the growth of sustainable and innovative new businesses. So on the whole, big businesses are coming out of COVID-19 crisis, even though we are in the midst of it still, but they're gonna come out of it much better than the small ones, and they're gonna recover much faster after the financial crisis. So a priority should be given to strengthening the small business sector, which accounts to, for a significant share of innovation, exports, and employment. Um, a healthy private sector depends on competition, and thus lower barriers to entry are needed. And there needs to be a strong link between the levels of competition in a given industry and its productivity growth. So we need to promote competitive markets. We need to ensure access to stimulus funding for small and medium-sized businesses. And we need to ease access to capital, especially foreign exchange. That is vitally important. You know, myself, um, you know, I need to buy supplies and, and I need US dollars to do that. And it's very difficult right now to source those funds. I have to use my credit card and, and then you have your credit card fee. So, uh, you know, in addition to buying these foreign supplies, which are not manufactured locally, you then have to pay the credit card fees associated with it, right? So my, and I'm a small business owner, right? So my sixth um, point is to make the public sector function more efficiently and productively, productively, productively. In specific terms, there are two major ways to drive constructive change. Um, first, there's technology. There's a great deal of scope to use automation to deliver better routine services that would free up personnel to take on more complex and personalized tasks. And this is both in the public and the private sector. And the second way to drive constructive change is through people. At its best, the public sector is mission driven, a factor that can be underestimated. So this should be emphasized and a way to inspire people and the government to do things differently. And uh, Jesse May, that's my, um, my contribution, my prepared contribution. Thank you very much, um, Dr. C. Chiran. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we want to acknowledge uh, with us this evening, Mr. Peter Kanhai, he is past president of the uh, Greek Tunapuna Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Um, we also uh, want to acknowledge that uh, MP Amin uh, wanted to make a comment. So we will take the comment uh, from MP Amin, and then we'll also invite Mr. Kanhai uh, to make a comment as well um, to reflect on what he would have heard before we open up the floor for wider questions for you, Dr. Sichiran. Um. MP Amin, you have the floor. I 
believe you need to unmute your mic. Hello. Hello. Yes. yes. MP, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Can you just say that again? Uh, you, we can hear you. Please go ahead. You have the floor. I understand you wanted to make a comment um, during the um, presentation. Oh, yes. I was, um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge the points being made by Esmond Ford as a member of parliament where he can list so many of the roads um, being paved and the projects that are ongoing in the Tunapuna constituency. St. Augustine constituency is along the east-west corridor. The north of the main road is Tunapuna and south of the main road is St. Augustine. And the, the unfair allocation of government resources must be a part of this conversation. Um, because I can tell you, for instance, that the, the labor that is available through URP for MP Ford to collaborate with businesses to contribute material to do projects in the area is definitely not the same in St. Augustine. Um, there are 49 CPEP gangs in St. Joseph. There are 15 in St. Augustine and um and quite a and double that in tunapuna my colleague in skyony east would also share that um the unfair distribution of government resources when it comes to um these projects put us at a severe disadvantage i do hope that um, um mp ford even though he's not a minister and we do have another minister uh, marvin honorable marvin gonzalez I do hope that they would utilize their voice through the collaboration in this forum for similar resources to be allocated to the other constituencies that are part of this greater Tunapuna area so that we can develop the region and move forward and not to have, I mean, a whole list of roads paved in Tunapuna, a list of roads paved in St. Joseph, and no roads paved in St. Augustine and Kyrene East and so on, you know? <laughs> So while we talk, while we are talking about development and what we hope to see and the reality of what is happening on the ground um, is also, um, I think we have to deal with that. And um, I hope that um, and MP Ford will have my support in voicing to his ministerial colleagues the need for that equitable distribution of resources. Honorable members, uh, may I just intervene here in this moment? Um, may, I, may I summarize? by saying that clearly you both are on the same page and it sounds as though you know you've made overtures to each other and we can expect great things in the future for the greater tuna puna area when you collaborate and share resources and visions and expertise how does that sound is this, could is not, this okay? I, I could not i could not have said it as how you said it agree okay. all right <laughs> no yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No i'm comment. seeing I'm seeing the virtual handshake and backslapping taking place. You've done it in public. It's being recorded. We can play it back for you just in case you need to refresh your memory at some later date. Yeah, um, and, and I think, you know, because the chamber is hosting this session, um, you have some mutual ground on which government and opposition MPs can meet. We don't have many spaces like this. Um, but the advocacy going forward has to be a collaborative effort as well, because a request coming from myself as an opposition MP is treated very differently from a request coming from a government MP. Um, and it will be treated um, probably in higher regard if it's coming from the Tunapuna chamber. So I think meeting in a space like this and agreeing on what is required going forward um, and then taking that to the government as a team, seeking the interest of the region um, might be a middle ground to evening the playing field a little bit when it comes to the allocation of resources and the development of the region in going forward. But I, 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 am, I am so intrigued to hear how many roads come MP Ford can list as being paved in his area while I'm begging for Evans Street, which is next to UE, to be paved. I am begging for materials. I'm 
getting, I, I mean, I'm going to stockpiles and, and, and getting people to donate their time and labor, <laughs> you know. Um, so I um, do hope that uh, you, uh, um, maybe I mean, my <laughs> colleagues here can... <laughs> All we right, can, we can, uh, Madam Moderator. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to um, function like this because the house. Um, please, um, I'll, I'll abide by your ruling. Take your, I'll take your, your take ruling. your seats, please, members. I'll take your by seats. Let, 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 let's, let's calm down. Let's have a sip of water. We do have Dr. Citran waiting for um, persons to put questions to him. Um, we do have Mr. Kanhai, I believe, who wants to make a contribution or two. Uh, we do have people who want to comment on what they would have heard Dr. Citran put forward this evening. So let's bring Mr. Kanhai on very quickly. Mr. Kanhai, you, you have the floor. Uh, thank you for joining us. All right, it seems that Mr. Kanhai may not be ready. So let's um, look back at um, Dr. Sicharan's presentation. And um, the idea, uh, Dr. Sicharan, I just wanna go back to um, your point about nurturing innovative and new businesses um, to ensure that small and micro businesses are able to survive uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you talked about the fact that we needed to, to, you know, emphasize competitiveness. But looking at your constituency in particular, uh, what are the, the key kinds of businesses in your constituency that you think need to get that special nurturing um, and that special assist with regard to, to helping them become more competitive and more sustainable uh, going into the future? Thank you, Jesse. Um, well, definitely agriculture. You know, um, we have a lot of agricultural land in Karanese. Uh, we have a lot of farmers. It has traditionally been a farming area, you know, but we have some business areas along the St. Helena Main Road, as well as along the old Southern Main Road. So those are our business activity areas. And uh, we have a number of small and medium sized businesses in those areas. But uh, a lot of our constituents are farming based. And we definitely need a lot of help in terms of getting them to get their produce to market and being able to sell effectively. Uh, you know, we had Karani Green a few years ago that were, it was producing a fair amount of produce and was able to sell internationally and produce foreign exchange for, the, uh, for Trinidad and Tobago. And these are initiatives that I would have liked to see implemented similar to that in this, uh, in this government's term. So there is an opportunity, particularly in your constituency, for any members in the chamber uh, to consider investing heavily in agriculture and agribusiness. Is that what you're hinting at? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, we don't know how long this COVID pandemic issue would last in Trinidad and Tobago. We have the issue of vaccines, and then we are seeing a very huge surge. You know, you and I talked this morning, around 6 o'clock this morning, um, and then we have figures that came out this afternoon saying that apparently we have 170 something new cases. And I hinted to you that we don't know what the, um, what the actual level of the surge would be. We were considering 134 would be the highest it would go. And then this afternoon we are hearing 170 something. So we don't know how long this pandemic would last. And because of that, we, a lot of persons that are in the food industry have been decimated. Um, and this is not only in Karanese, this is around the country. Um, persons that had invested into restaurants, into catering, um, events planning, you know, all of these persons, they are totally lost. I, I feel so sorry for someone if they actually took a loan to open, open one of these businesses. Um, so with, with that being said, and the vaccination rollout being so slow, you know, we have only vaccinated 2% of our population, and that is only with one dose. 
Um, and then we have the fact that there's possibly the more transmissible variant now in the mix in Trinidad and Tobago, and I hope it is not. You know, so the situation we have with our partial lockdown, with our health restrictions, is going to last, in my opinion, well into this year, um, into the end of this year, and hopefully not, but into next year. Um, so, you know, going into the um, food industry, um, in terms of the restaurant business, in, in terms of catering, these persons, that industry is, is almost dead right now. It's, it, it's completely gone. And, and, and thus, it's not a viable business to invest in right now. Um, and we have to probably look at agriculture in terms of feeding our nation and reducing some of our food import bill um, so that we could free up some foreign exchange for, for more valuable things that we may need in the country. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. C. Chiran. Um, uh, I just want to piggyback on what you just said a moment ago um, with regard to food production and broaden it a little bit. Um, food, uh, a country's ability to feed itself is a critical thing. And during times of crisis, um, we learn very quickly how well we are able to do that. So food production is a national security issue. You have indicated that your constituency is primarily agriculture based. Uh, we have in the St. Augustine constituency some agriculture, but we also have major tertiary institutions, one of which used to be the Imperial College for Tropical Agriculture doing amazing research into, into agriculture. Uh, parts of Tunapuna also um, involved in agriculture. And I'm, I'm thinking now, why do we not have a, a discussion with you, our three MPs, teaming together with members of the chamber and looking at this issue of food security for Trinidad and Tobago, given that um, some of the, what, what we could consider the country's food basket, one of the country's food baskets resides in this area. And we also uh, have uh, the capacity to take things even further with the, with the research and development of new crops, uh, production processes, techniques. And we also have the, the manufacturing capacity in, from an agribusiness standpoint because we've got the industrial estates and so on and so forth. So perhaps uh, coming out of this, we could see a push towards a food security, not so much import substitution, to reduce the food import bill, even though that is a, a powerful offshoot, but definitely making sure that we can feed ourselves because we learned a bitter lesson last year when we weren't able to get certain things on our shelves. And now that we're looking forward to the future post pandemic, uh, this is something that I think should be taken on board. I'm not sure how many other um, members who are here today would agree with me. Are there members here who are interested in uh, the food production business, not necessarily growing the food in the ground, but doing something with it once it's harvested? And there are also the export opportunities as well for whatever products come out, which will earn us the foreign exchange that we definitely need, and which will probably ease up your credit card when you're looking for foreign, um, for, for US dollars, uh, Dr. C. Chiran. Yes? Um, yeah. you're and perhaps a comment from our other MPs and uh, uh, maybe the president of the chamber as well. So we'll start with you, Dr. Sijiran. Uh, I definitely think so. You know, we have to look into promoting our farmers. Um, in the last fiscal budget, um, the Minister of Agriculture hinted that um, there would be a $500 million um, incentive to farmers. I'm not exactly sure if that has been implemented um, as the pandemic has gone on in terms of funding. But our farmers need assistance, they need help. Um, you know, we had an issue, uh, I think they were having problems with um, probably fertilizers or pesticides, I'm not sure, or, and in some cases with, with animal feed, I think it was, there was a stage where there was a lack of feed uh, for certain animals in the country. Um, so. You know, the farmers need help. They have, in some cases, livestock. In some cases, you know, um, 
um, be it vegetables or fruits that they may be trying to get into the market. And they, they need assistance in bringing these to market. Uh, we need food processing plants that would be able to, in some cases, um, have these produce able for export um, to different CARICOM neighbors and even regionally. And, and we need to heavily invest in farming because as you can see, the energy industry is on its decline, unfortunately. And we can't rely as heavily as we did in the past on that producing our foreign exchange for us to purchase medicines or, or whatnot that we may need. Um, so we definitely have to go back to our farmers and, and they should be the backbone of, of any, um, any recovery effort that we would need post pandemic. All right, um, we do have a, a follow-up comment with regard to this agriculture issue. Uh, this person asking, I believe it's Alison Walker asking, are your constituents members of the Agriculture Association? The newly appointed executive is a young one and is very excited with all the new technology available for farmers. So perhaps that's a little bit of networking that um, you and your people may need to do yeah. uh, in that respect. Uh, we also um, have uh, an observation from, uh, with regard to garbage collection by business owners, particularly in the Tunapuna St. Augustine region. Uh, I guess um, someone wrapping business owners on the knuckles and saying that they need to be a little more conscientious and beware of the environment and that they're functioning in and do better with their garbage disposal. Uh, and also we have a question here, and this probably can go out to all three MPs, someone from, and I suspect this is someone from the creative entertainment industry. Um, has any consideration been given to the live event industry as, uh, as a business opportunity? Since you have the floor right now, Dr. Citran, you can respond very quickly. The live, the live events industry right now, um would be very difficult. Right now we have limitations on the number of persons that could gather. So for the next um, probably 18 days or so, it could only be five. And what I'm seeing right now is that the cases are increasing. Um, and as I told Jesse this morning, we don't know what the peak is. You know, We have no idea. It could be a number that we don't want to even consider. Um, so in terms of live events, that that is something that I would be very tentative in, in promoting until we conquer this coronavirus in the region. And, and we would not be able to do so until we vaccinate at least 70% of our country. Unfortunately, we are nowhere close to that. Um, and as I said, I, I could foresee quite easily we're going into next year under similar conditions that we are in right now. Uh, any comments from uh, the other two MPs? Um, Madam Moderator, yes. Um, on the topic of agriculture, right, as far as I'm aware, the 500 million agriculture stimulus package, again, through the NAMDEPCO, through also the Agriculture Development Bank, right? Because again, I know applications have been sent out in order where individuals can apply in order to access the various facilities with regards to agriculture. And then all the various uh, VAT-free custom duties exemption on the particular agricultural items for registered agricultural farmers are still in place, right? They continue to exist. I think it's the whole idea of, you know, as we as MPs tapping in to the Ministry of Agriculture, to ensure that our constituents, especially you know, the farming aspects of those individuals are considered. With regards to, as uh, somebody spoke about garbage disposal. Again, garbage disposal is something that we have been doing now for a lifetime, right? All of us for a lifetime. And somehow, sometimes we don't seem to get it right. The idea of simply putting out your garbage uh, in a respectful manner, when I say respectful manner, a proper garbage bag, not properly put in a disposal receptacle. And, and you know, a simple thing, 
members of the Greater Tunapuna Chamber and other colleagues who are there. The evening garbage disposal sanitation truck will come down the Eastern Main Road and collect all the disposal bags from the various businesses. And for example, simple as it is, Pennywise and some of those large entities have been given limited quotas of garbage bags. Like for instance, Pennywise, not supposed to put out more than 30 garbage bags on any particular evening. Because if they do put out hundreds of bags, you know what will happen? Somebody will be, will be left out as we go along. Again, I am not a medical practitioner. I, I, I cannot speak directly again for the Minister of Health. Uh, Dr. Sichuan, I know is a medical practitioner. Um, vaccination slow, but according to the last memo, it's 19,765 vaccination as of this evening. And I think over a two week period from when we start, that gives us roughly 1,400 persons being vaccinated on a daily basis. And you know, if we work out the maths as we go along, you know, again, right? We have presently, I think, 70,000 vac vaccines in Trinidad and Tobago, anticipated that we are going to get more because again, we, we are hearing the news every day as what's happening with, the, with regards to the vaccination. Again, um, I don't want the song to negative and be a naysayer. I think for the time being, we are going pretty fine. But again, I'll leave that for the health practitioners. And with regards to my colleague, um, my good colleague, you know, who chaired me at the Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation. Again, we can work together, but again, Orange Grove Road was paved within your area. Part of Paje Main Road was also paved in your area. Good to see your MP colleague, but we leave that there. And with regards to the live events, Madam Moderator, again, like my colleague member, um, MP Sucharan, I will not go for live events. We have to go virtually. It's presently at five. And uh, we'll have to stick to those regulations. So we'll have to ensure that we remain virtually for the time being and see how best we can go forward from there. We need to ensure that we still wear our masks, we still sanitize, we still wash our hands, and still go out and get your vaccine. Thank you. Uh, Madam MP, Khadija Amin, would you want to add anything? Uh, Jesse, if, if I may add something. Go ahead, please. So I, I, I have a lot of respect for, um, for Esmond Ford, um, member of parliament, um, but it, the vaccination process is too slow. So um, we, to, to reach herd immunity, everyone has to get two doses and, and um, minimum doses Trinidad and Tobago needs is a million doses. Um, so 70,000 is, is 35,000 persons being fully vaccinated. So the 18,000 is population, one. colleague, for a population of 1.3, 1.4 million people, we need a million persons to be vaccinated. A million doses. A million doses is 500,000 persons. Oh, okay. Mill okay, the right. doses, okay. Right, yeah. okay. So 500,000 so is the figure yeah. you're looking at. Okay. Right, so, and, and 500,000 is a low figure. We, we probably need to vaccinate and, about 700,000 minimum. So the real, the real figure is really about 1.4 million doses. Okay. And, and that has been confirmed by our CMO. Dr. That is confirmed internationally. That is WHO standards. So herd immunity is about 70% of the population. Not a problem, um, colleague. Yeah. So, you know, I know we have 70,000 doses in the country right now, um, be it from Barbados, um, from the government of India, as well as the first tra the first two tranches from, um, Covax. from Covax. But it, um, that is 70,000 doses, it's 35,000 persons. And I'm, I'm happy, I'm so glad that our most vulnerable ha have gotten, most of them are, are, are willing to get it vaccinated. Um, but, you know, yes, before we could open our borders, um, you know, right now I, I read the United States has travel restrictions on 80% of the globe. So before the United States opens its borders to us, we would have to achieve herd immunity. And um, achieving herd immunity is, is um, by yes, my yes. 1.4 million doses, that is 700,000 persons being vaccinated. And we're not gonna do that this year. We, that is not gonna happen um, and unless drastic changes are made. And the Minister of Health should reach out to the opposition. We have a lot of good ideas. I am willing to, to give ideas, I'm willing to help. 
um, assist in any way we can, because we all need to get out of this um, health regulations and the lockdown as soon as possible. Businesses are suffering, people are suffering. You know, it's it, this is not a easy period to be, you know, in existence in Trinidad and Tobago or, or around the world for that matter. So all of us need to work together to get out of this as soon as possible. Gentlemen, we have a comment here from uh, Nebert Marine uh, saying it will take us 16 months to vaccinate 750,000 people, which means no carnival 2022. So another year, one of our um, big earners, we won't be able to capitalize on. Quite that. possibly, quite possibly. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Mr. Marine, for that comment. Mm -hmm. uh, do we do we have uh, any comments coming from uh, the chamber president, Melissa Senhouse, on anything that she's heard thus far? Thanks, Jasini. I am in agreement with the MPs as it pertains to food security, as we know it's a must, and we're happy to see that all the MPs present are in agreement. So the chamber will be more than happy to facilitate a meeting to discuss this further, as well as um, MP Amin's suggestion about the vendors by the Karani Bridge. And as um, MP Ford mentioned that we could lobby the TPRC. So perhaps this is something that we could all work together. Sure. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, do we have a comment from Mr. Kanhai? Past president, I understand that he wanted to make a comment. Mr. Kanhai? Yes, hi. Good afternoon. Are you all hearing me now? Yes, we're hearing you loud and clear. Okay. So floor. good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to the MPs involved. I'm very happy to see that the chamber is continuing this initiative um, that began several years ago. And... Um, let me thank all the MPs that have actually made themselves available to be here. And um, I'll get right into it. I, I joined the meeting uh, maybe about an hour late, so I didn't hear all of the contributions from all of the uh, MPs, but, I, but I'm sure that there would have been some specific items that um, should have come up if they didn't, um, as it relates and to the chamber's jurisdiction and in particular, the, uh, the Tonapuna uh, area, um, and just to name a few of them, the lack of car parking facilities in the township of Tonapuna, the issue of the uh, um, antiquated Tonapuna fire station, which was an issue even when I was president. Um, and I know that uh, the chamber had, during my time and, and after, made several recommendations for that fire station. I all, I, I, um, I mean, the, the, the thing about that fire station and the Tonapuna and, and surrounding areas, it is that it is so densely populated and a fire station with one fire tender is really, really, really um, not the way we should be going. And, um, I know the recommendation was made by the chamber years ago for government to consider we uh, put in that fire station. And I, I understand that Mr. Ford, MP Ford may have spoken up about it this afternoon, that that fire station should go somewhere in the vicinity of the, um, the market on the highway for a couple of reasons. One, there is land space and two, there is access in every direction. The recommendation of the chamber in the past was for this current site of the current fire station to be converted into a multi-story car park for Tonapu. So I just want to put that back on the table. There was also the issue of borough status for the Tonapuna Piaco region. I mean, Tonapuna Piaco is probably the largest re region in terms of population and from the research that was done by the chamber, it have all the attributes required to take it beyond borough station, borough status, in fact. But we will start with borough status. There is the university. There is hospitals, private and public, including Mount Hope. 
there are educational institutions, and I will come to that on education city in a little while. Um, there is every uh, attribute that is required for making the Tonapuna Piaco region a borough. And that, uh, that, of course, will touch the constituencies of all the MPs that are on here tonight. Um, so I hope that we can see something happening in that direction. Education City, I, I, I know from my past inter interactions with MP Ford that I don't have to sell him on the importance of Education City. And I know I wouldn't have to sell that to MP Khadija Amin either. So that is another thing that I think the Chamber and at least those two MPs should be on common ground with. Um, and the benefits of, of, of that initiative, I think, is uh, well worth the effort and it is well um, in the benefit, to, in the interests of the population in this region. Now, I, I heard some conversation going on about food security. And on behalf of the chamber, I recall way back in 2008 or nine, I think it was eight, taking to the then Minister of Finance a proposal, a budget proposal for consideration to be given to the Orange Grove estate lands that are, well, now owned by the University of the West Indies. We see it as we drive up and down the highway opposite the Twin City Mall area. The, and, and the proposal was that perhaps a tripartite arrangement, the university, the government, the business community in Tonapuna and environs can come together and utilize that estate that is under the uh, university to develop some initiatives towards food security. The university can do the, the studies and recommend the crops, et cetera, et cetera. There are farmers in the area. The government can enable um, some of the infrastructure and so on and encourage the business community to get involved, back the farmers, build processing plant or a plant or plants in the area to utilize that land that is currently just growing bush. And that is something I also want to put back on the table um, for consideration by all concerned here tonight, the chamber, the MPs, and if there are any representatives of the Tanapuna Piaco Regional Corporation. If not, I am sure the, the past members who are now MPs would have a word with them on that. But I, I, I again want to congratulate the Chamber for um, this initiative. Um, COVID times uh, and Zoom is ideal for this. And I want to congratulate all who have contributed to um, bringing this to a reality. I, I, I also saw that there is a former board member on board. I want to say good afternoon to Mr. Vishnu Balu. Um, and to all those who are with us here this evening, and I hope that um, all of the comments made here this evening, all of the initiatives enunciated, and all of the commitments made can be followed through and that we can see some real tangible um, results going forward. And I will push, I will continue to push through the chamber and any other avenue that I have to see some of these things come to fruition and to reality for the, not just for the members of the chamber and the community of Tonapuna Piaco, but for the country as well. So by the way, we also have the airport in the Tonapuna Piaco region. So we, we have everything to go beyond borough status, as to go to city status for that matter. But as I said, let's start with borough status. Thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Kanhai. Um, many of the issues that you raised would have been dealt with either by MP Amin or MP Ford. Um, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that you missed um, so much of their respective um, presentations. Um, I just want to put a couple points out there. Um, MPs, perhaps you need to address this issue the next time there is discussion in Parliament 
with regard to adjusting the COVID-19 regulations. Uh, uh, Vishnu Balu uh, seeking clarification. Uh, they've reduced the people gatherings to five, but have they indicated how big a space those five people should, should occupy? Is it five people on a space as, as big as Eddie Hart grounds? Or, you know, that kind of specificity needs to be included in the regulations the next time adjustments are made. So you would need to discuss with your um, respected parliamentary colleagues the way forward on that. Um, with regard to the agriculture, the plans for the agriculture sector and food security, Ahim Raji Singh uh, is reminding us that the giant African snails can put a spoke in our wheel. That's something that needs to be addressed with some urgency. And I do believe that we, we have covered um, as many of the questions that you would have brought forward this evening. Our participants, thank you so much. Uh, we tried to group your concerns uh, as effectively as we can, and our MPs also tried to give you the responses um, as best as they could. Uh, we'd like to hear very quickly from uh, current Chamber President, uh, Melissa Stenhouse, once more. Jessime, thank you. Um, I would like to thank all the MPs for their contribution. Um, Mr. Kanhai, as past president of the Greater Tunifino Chamber, your comments and your support is always welcome and appreciated. Thank you very much. Jesse May? Yes, I am, I'm still here. Uh, I believe that we've come to the end of the substantive part of the evening's proceedings, but it is always a fantastic idea whenever great minds come together to say thank you uh, for making something like this happen. And to bring the vote of thanks, we would like to call on the chamber board member, Mr. Ramon Gregorio. You have the floor, Mr. Gregorio. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, MPs and members of the Greater Tunifuna Chamber. Thank you very much for being part of our session with the MPs. It has been very insightful, and I've been given the honor to offer a vote of thanks to, 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 to the panel this, this evening. To MP for St. Augustine Khadija, I mean, thank you for your focus on enlightening us on your agriculture as you way forward, some of your ideas about the mitigation of flooding and impacts on the farmers in this region as well as your, your call for collaboration. I think it's a very central theme um, in, in, in a, in a COVID-19 pandemic world, collaboration and all hands on deck being a very interesting theme. And thank you very much for highlighting that and, call, and demonstrating the need for, for collaborative partnerships. For MP for Tunapuna, Esmond Ford, um, thanks for enlightening us about the Tunapuna um, and environs area. Very, very topical issue for us at the, at the chamber. Um, talking about the flood works in Tunapuna area, the National Special Economic Zone. I know that's quite um, keen. Persons are quite keen for that to, to, to come on board. As well as an update on the Tunapuna borough status conversation, as well as a general update on the infrastructural works in the Tunapuna area. And thank you so much for updating us on that. And for MP for Karani East, Richard, Richard Sicharan, who happens to be a colleague of mine, a good old schoolmate. Nice to see you again, MP Sicharan. Thanks for giving us your six point um, agenda in terms of telling us about promoting productivity, which I think is a very central theme. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs in the chamber and wider Caribbean have now been forced to become innovative, have now been, have been now forced to adopt technology in a different way. And thanks for your insights along that, those themes. I think it's a message that needs to be repeated time and time again. If we don't innovate, we'll die. Um, sorry to be so, dra so drab, but that's essentially it, especially, and, and COVID-19 has shown us that. So thank you very much, MB, for Karen East, Richard Sicharan. And also, Mr. Kanhai, past president, thanks for offering your, your, your sentiments. Thanks for giving us your perspectives as a past chamber president, as well as your vision and your hope for developments in, in the integrated to
by the business community of Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you very much, everyone, for being part of this, this evening's initiative. I hope you walked away with some food for thought. And until the next time, be safe. And I hope 2021 pans out for you in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that you expect, given all the challenges with COVID-19 and life in general. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Gregorio. Uh, we have a quick comment here from Esmond Ford. Good meeting. We need to document this session uh, with an official report. Well, um, uh, Mr. MP, the session has been recorded. And uh, yes, I think they took all of that into consideration. So rest assured, um, you'll be getting more details on this session uh, from the chamber. Uh, I would like to thank the Chamber for giving me the opportunity to uh, moderate this session. I'm looking forward to hearing great things coming out of it. Uh, as someone working in the news, I uh, would love to report on some of these initiatives that we talked about today. Looking forward to that. Uh, and on that note, uh, I will pass over to Madam President uh, to make the, the final word and to dismiss us all, Madam President. Thank you, Ms. Jesse May. You are an excellent moderator. We thoroughly enjoyed having you. To the MPs, we thank you for your time and your presence and your presentations and contributions. Mr. Kanhai, we thank you for your contributions and, and, um, and your suggestions. And we will definitely do some documentation and follow up with further meetings based on all the contributions and suggestions that were made. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. Be blessed, everyone.